SOFIA stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It's a NASA facility that will be operated from uh, NASA's Ames Research Center near San Francisco. It's a 747 SP aircraft into which we've installed a 100-inch telescope, the same size as Hubble, uh, that will be uh, flying in the stratosphere uh, doing infrared astronomy for, we hope, a mission of 20 years length. And um, the benefits of SOFIA or why NASA is doing this, uh, it's, it's more versatile and above most of the atmosphere uh, compared to a ground-based observatory. Uh, uh, and uh, ground-based observatories even on mountaintops have a little bit of obscuration and have to fight some atmospheric phenomena. And, uh, uh, but uh, compared to a space telescope, it's much less expensive, much easier to get to. Sophia comes home every night and we can swap out the instruments and put up a different set for the next day's uh, mission, do the repairs and so on, whereas if you want to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, you have to mount an entire space shuttle expedition up to it. Gerard Kuiper was uh, a Dutch-born uh, American astronomer, uh, worked at the University of Chicago for decades, and for uh, the, the period after World War II, he was the only uh, astronomer really seriously interested in the planets. Uh, one of his, his most famous students is Carl Sagan. And uh, Kuiper said, we should have airborne observatories. Uh, uh, he had the, the intuition that it would be better than a ground-based observatory, but uh, uh, far less challenging than a space-based observatory. And as a result of his uh, nudging, NASA arranged uh, a small observatory, a 10-inch telescope, on board a Learjet that was based at NASA Ames in the uh, uh, late 60s and early 70s. And uh, that was a success. Uh, there were uh, many discoveries made with that Learjet. One of the ones that people might recognize is the fact that Jupiter and uh, Saturn give off more heat than they take in from the sun. Those observations were made with the Learjet. And uh, when uh, uh, the Learjet success led people to plan a larger uh, uh, airborne observatory, which was named posthumously after Gerard Kuiper, as the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. That's uh, a C-141 cargo jet into which NASA installed a 36-inch telescope, 0.9 meter diameter uh, reflecting telescope. And that operated also from NASA Ames for the period uh, 1975 to 96 and uh, made many uh, important discoveries. One of them was the discovery of water vapor in the interstellar medium and the place where planets and stars form. Uh, so that's uh, probably part of the story about how water got uh, incorporated in the Earth when it formed. Also discovered that there are rings around the planet Uranus uh, and uh, a host of other uh, discoveries that are important to the astronomical community. Well, halfway through the 20-year lifetime of the Kuiper, it was already clear that we might want to do better, have a bigger telescope and a bigger airplane, and so a workshop was convened to plan the successor to the Kuiper and uh, that was eventually designated SOFIA, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. So SOFIA was conceived 10 years uh, before the Kuiper was done with its, with its mission. And um, the biggest plane that uh, was easily commercially available at the time was a 747. Uh, and uh, so the plan was made to, to buy a 747 used from uh, an airline, and we finally bought ours from United Airlines, but uh, the same plane had previously been with Pan Am. And uh, the uh, German space agency, DLR, are partners with uh, the United States and NASA in uh, funding and operating SOFIA. They are 20 percent partners, uh, and uh, the German space agency uh, arranged for the construction of the telescope through subcontractors in Europe. So. Uh, uh, starting when the, when the Kuiper was retired in, I think that was 96, uh, the plan was, uh, in, went into high gear to build SOFIA. And, uh, uh, and we're not quite finished yet, but we're almost done. And, and so SOFIA is a, a grander, um, more versatile, far more instruments available, uh, a larger set of the astronomical community targeted to be, uh, to be users of it than the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which served uh, very 
faithfully and valiantly, uh, if that's the right word for an aircraft, for 20 years and is parked right in this hangar here uh, where, where our offices are. Well, SOFIA is uh, uh, planned to fly at an altitude of 41,000 to 45,000 feet, that's 12 to 14 kilometers, in the lower reaches of the stratosphere. Uh, the reason for that is the, the troposphere, the bottom layer of the Earth's atmosphere in which we live, contains almost all the water vapor. The currents that, that uh, circulating currents and so on do not penetrate into the, into the stratosphere, so the, the, um, the, the stratosphere is dry, very dry, and uh, water vapor is the main uh, blockage for infrared radiation from outer space reaching the surface of the Earth. So by flying at those altitudes in the stratosphere, uh, SOFIA is above 99.5% of the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere, although only above about 70% of the atmosphere itself. So the engines still work. And uh, we can uh, have almost the transparency of, of the air above SOFIA as if SOFIA were in space in terms of being able to receive uh, infrared radiation from space. So uh, why would be, we want to receive infrared as opposed to any other kind of radiation from space? So the electromagnetic spectrum, light, infrared radiation, radio waves, ultraviolet, and so on, um, uh, we, astronomers get a completely different picture uh, of the heavens depending on which of those wave bands we study. In particular, infrared uh, carries information from objects that are cooler than the sun. Uh, the sun makes mostly visible light, light that our eyes respond to. Infrared radiation uh, would be made primarily by objects cooler than the sun. For example, stars that are forming, planets that are forming, uh, the clouds in which stars and planets form, and so on. So what, that's uh, uh, the, the, one of the main interests of infrared astronomers is the process of star formation, trying to study it as it happens, uh, how, how the material is arranged that ends up being turned into planetary systems out there. Also in the infrared uh, spectral region are the spectroscopic characteristics of simple molecules, the uh, rotational transitions of simple molecules like water and ammonia and so on are, are at far infrared wavelengths and that radiation just doesn't reach the ground. It doesn't even reach a mountaintop. For instance, Mauna Kea Observatory, the highest uh, uh, optical observatory on Earth in Hawaii at an altitude of 14,000 feet. You can't study uh, uh, the, the sky at wavelengths between 30 microns and um, about 400 microns. That whole stretch, which we call the far infrared, is um, not studyable from Mauna Kea, but is easily studied from, uh, from Sophia. SOFIA will have a two and a half meter telescope, about a hundred inch diameter main mirror, which is the same size as Hubble, and that'll be carried in a chamber at the back of the plane, just in front of the tail, that's uh, separated from the, the uh, crew cabin by a pressure bulkhead, so the people on board will be working in a shirt sleeve environment, uh, like being on a commercial airliner but the telescope will be exposed to space. There's no window material we could choose that would let all of the radiation at all the wavelengths we want to study through, so we just open a door on the side of the aircraft and the telescope looks out uh, through this opening. Uh, the telescope is a, a basically a reflecting telescope of a familiar design to anybody who's had a hobbyist's telescope, uh, although it's got a very short focal length because we have to stuff it into the fuselage of the airplane. So it's a, a, a primary mirror, a secondary mirror, and then a third mirror, the tertiary mirror that bounces the light horizontally along a tube and into the cabin where we uh, mount an instrument, say uh, a, a spectrograph or a camera, uh, on the end of this uh, 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 tube with a flange that is intruded into the cabin of the aircraft where the uh, scientists can, can get at it and work on the instrument if they need to during flight. So uh, we get the, gather the light with the telescope and then put it into the cabin uh, and where it reaches is focused into a camera or a spectrograph. The 
telescope has a small degree of freedom of motion inside the cavity, but uh, most of the motion uh, uh, azimuthally, so to speak, in other words, the, the direction that you need to turn the telescope to track a star as the Earth turns will be taken care of by the airplane flying a long, slow arc across the Earth's surface. So the telescope control computer will talk to the autopilot of SOFIA uh, and, uh, and this is a little too delicate to uh, ask a pilot to, to keep us on track and, and keep the telescope pointed at a star. So the, the pointing of the telescope to, to compensate for the Earth's rotation will be taken care of by the plane, slowly uh, making a, a very grand turn, a thousand mile arc across uh, part of the Earth's surface. So our path that we fly with SOFIA will not depend at all on what's down below. It will be, depend on which uh, objects in the sky are being studied and in which order and then we just fly big curves, loop-de-loops all over the eastern Pacific and the western U.S. when we're based at NASA Ames. This is truly uh, a, a historic day for uh, infrared astronomy. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the arrival of this aircraft uh, for the hundreds of infrared astronomers across the world, uh, Germany and the U.S. in particular, but other places as well, this is truly historic. Uh, it's kind of like when the uh, Beluga took its turn around. The, we have turned the corner on Sophia. Uh, we are definitely on the way. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your efforts this far, and get it on with. Um, this is an observatory that is uh, uh, it's science driven, uh, and science is the motivation for SOFIA. Um, and uh, there will be uh, lots of scientific discoveries made on SOFIA, and I can't tell you now what they will be, but I can tell you some of the areas uh, where we're going to be looking and uh, why we're so excited about uh, getting this telescope uh, up into the stratosphere. If you go up in the stratosphere, the infrared visibility uh, opens up. It's like uh, uh, between a night, a night and day. You don't see the stars in the daytime, but uh, at night you do. Well, in, in the infrared, you fly up in the stratosphere, you start seeing the st stars again. So it's, uh, it just opens up. Um, it's been uh, known for quite a while there's a lot of chemistry uh, going on in space. Uh, but now we have a new thing uh, and Sophia is going to be right at the heart of this uh, new uh, study, which is, is there biology in space? Uh, you can measure organic molecules in the infrared, and right now this observatory will be the best for studying organic molecules. And I know Tom Green, in fact, is one of the leaders in making sure we have the right instrumentation to make this study. So that is one area. Uh, is there life? Did life come here on Earth, or did it come from uh, outer space? And we have the tools that can answer just a tremendous number of the questions uh, in that regard. Another thing that's been found over the last five years, ten years, uh, and I've been part of this uh, research, uh, and the Germans have also, uh, is that uh, we have found that there is a black hole, a very massive object, in the very core of the Milky Way. That's our galaxy. You see it at night when it's dark across the sky. Well, in the very center, uh, all stars like our sun rotate around the center, there is a black hole whose mass is 2.5 million suns. So more than a million suns of mass into one concentrated area. In fact, by theory, it is a black hole. So everything that goes in uh, can't come out again. Well, as the material goes in, and we know that a lot of material has, um, it forms an accretion disk, and energy is given off. Some of it goes in the mass, but some of it goes into energy. Um, so we are going to be able to track both the mass that falls in and the energy is released. Of course, we don't know what goes into the black hole because it never comes out, but we will be able to study, actually, uh, how a black hole works, and we can do it in better detail than anybody else because of SOFIA. So uh, this is something I plan to do and is very exciting. Then the final thing that I am not involved in, but some of my colleagues are, and I know some of the uh, Germans are involved in this uh, and other people around the world, uh, as you look 
out into the universe, uh, there is a thing called a Doppler shift or the red shift. It's, uh, it's uh, due to the expansion of the universe. Um, and it's been known um, uh, for 50 years uh, that this is going on. Well, it turns out that if you're going to study this uh, phenomena, all of the optical light is redshifted into the infrared. So this is the best place to study it is in the infrared. So we're going to take Sophia up and do the very best job we can at studying the very first stars that formed in our universe way back uh, just after the Big Bang. Now that isn't all, that's just some of them, uh, and we're obviously very excited. Thank you. The mirror was subcontracted to a company in France, uh, and it was uh, lightweighted, which is the uh, uh, term we use for taking a mirror and uh, carving out large parts of its mass while still leaving it structurally strong enough uh, to not flex in the uh, in the environment as we uh, turn it and point it in different directions. So uh, the, uh, the, the telescope looks like a honeycomb pattern with most of the uh, mass removed, but it's still strong enough to keep the shape that it needs to to, to be an optically uh, a fine instrument. And it's coated with aluminum, uh, uh, so it's a glass mirror with aluminum coating, and that's the same thing that uh, uh, any ground-based observatory would uh, have in its telescope mirror, or the Hubble Space Telescope, same thing, a glass mirror with an aluminum coating. Like other major observatories, SOFIA has what we call a mirror coating facility, and that is uh, a place where we take the primary mirror uh, out of the telescope and uh, once a year clean it, strip it of its old aluminum coating, and put on a fresh coating of uh, thin coating of aluminum on the glass, uh, and uh, so keep uh, it clean and highly reflective. And uh, we have. Uh, a large vacuum tank and the telescope mirror goes into that and uh, aluminum, a little cube of aluminum is vaporized and the aluminum vapor then f uh, uh, crosses the vacuum tank and evenly coats the glass of the uh, telescope primary mirror and then we have a newly recoded mirror that can be then hauled back and put on board Sophia for another year's work. The process of, of getting to use SOFIA uh, is similar to for uh, other uh, ground-based observatories like uh, the Keck Observatory in Hawaii or uh, Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona. Astronomers uh, on a yearly cycle or twice a year cycle will write a telescope observing proposal, which is a, a two or three page document explaining what they want to do with your observatory and uh, 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 what nights they want, how many nights they would like to, to have, and in what season. Uh, and then these are judged by a panel of astronomers recruited for the purpose, uh, and the, uh, they're graded, and only the, the best of these proposals get awarded telescope time. For instance, at uh, Kitt Peak Observatory, it's something like 30% uh, of, of the telescope applications actually get awarded telescope time. And uh, I think the same at Keck, and I think we anticipate roughly the same proportion for SOFIA. So an astronomer who wants to use SOFIA will have written a, uh, will have to write a, a, pro uh, uh, a proposal and uh, will get uh, judged and awarded the telescope time which comes along with the funding to come out here uh, to NASA Ames to fly on the plane uh, and do the observations for the period of, of uh, perhaps two or three flights stretching out over a week and also uh, money to pay graduate students and uh, postdoctoral uh, assistants to analyze the data. So like a ground-based observatory uh, uh, at Mauna Kea or, or Kitt Peak or Cerro Tololo, the uh, astronomers are in a control room, in this case it'll be on board the plane, uh, watching their data come in, monitoring it with uh, computer analysis on the spot to see that they're getting more or less what they want to get in terms of, of sensitivity of the measurements they're trying to make, uh, um, whether they're detecting anything at all, that sort of thing. But this is not the analysis that you can turn into a scientific publication. You just want to make sure that everything's working and that you've got what you want in the can, so to speak. And then after the flight series, the astronomers would go home 
to whatever university or institution uh, that they work at and then spend months probably uh, uh, picking over the data, analyzing it this way and that way before writing it up for publication. And that's uh, the same process with SOFIA as with uh, any other observatory. So imagine a crew of astronomers from some university who have successfully proposed to use SOFIA and they've been awarded uh, three nights flights uh, stretching out over a week. And so they come here and they have already specified in their observing proposal what celestial objects they want to study. Not only the objects of, uh, of their main interest, but standard comparison objects that need to be observed so that you know what, what you're getting with your instrument. Okay? So they'll, they'll be here and we'll already know what objects they want to observe and in what order. So we will have produced a flight plan ahead of time that has Sophia's path over, uh, over the Earth uh, determined by the sequence of things that are going to be observed through the telescope. Uh, uh, the, the leaving here from Moffett Field, they'll fly well, maybe perhaps out over the Pacific, then take a turn, observe some other object, and spend the night uh, on, on uh, different flight segments studying different objects. So we have to file a flight plan like any other large aircraft. Uh, warning people uh, uh, and, and the Federal Aviation Administration uh, uh, where it is we're going with our 747, but in this case it's not determined by anything on the ground. It's, it's uh, just uh, what celestial objects are being studied in and in what order. So the night, uh, uh, the night observations have to be preceded by um, a preparation period of, of make, having a software solve of the problem of uh, what the perfect flight plan is to get all of these observations done in the right order, but also the instrument, a spectrograph or a camera, has to be uh, readied for the night and we have the facilities here in the, the uh, hangar uh, in a lab to simulate the environment that the instrument will have on board the plane attached to the telescope uh, so that we don't waste time in flight uh, uh, trying to tune up the camera or the or the other instrument, the spectrogra uh, spectrographs, um, uh, which, which was a problem with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. They were playing a little fast and loose, I'm told, uh, and uh, often spent half of a night's flight uh, banging on their camera or whatever, trying to get it to work. We don't want that. Uh, this is the time is too valuable on Sophia, so it'll be rigorous testing uh, in, a, in a realistic environment with the so same software and the same hardware that's on the plane with the camera here and then wheel that onto the plane uh, in the late afternoon and then we have tanks of liquid nitrogen in the tail of Sophia that uh, will be used, that'll, that'll be piped through the framework of the telescope to chill it down to the temperature uh, of the stratosphere which is about minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit uh, so that we don't have a nice warm telescope and then open the door to the stratospheric temperatures. Uh, that, uh, that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work. You'd uh, take a long time to equilibrate. Uh, even though it's dry up there, you'd still have some condensation, so on. You don't want that. So the, te the telescope would be uh, chilled um, on the ground before the flight. The uh, astronomers would get on board uh, late in the afternoon because our, our flight departures would normally be around dusk. Uh, sunset and then our return home would be around sunrise uh, and uh, the, the camera has been ready, the astronomers are ready, the flight path is known, uh, calculated by our software and then off we go for the night. As SOFIA is uh, intended to be open to the world scientific community, all the astronomers in the world uh, ha would have an opportunity to observe on SOFIA we want to have a, a program where we bring educators from across at least the United States and eventually uh, uh, worldwide to partner on board SOFIA with the astronomers to understand the research process, to understand uh, how research really works, all the blood, sweat, and tears involved in real research instead of the textbook scientific method explanation. So we have a program we call the Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors that will uh, invite uh, teams of educators, uh, classroom teachers, edu uh, science museum personnel, avid amateur astronomers, to apply as teams of two to four uh, people to then be uh, matched with an astronomer team 
that has said on their telescope application, yes, I would like an educator team to fly with us uh, uh, on board. And they'll fly on Sophia uh, for the research series of flights of their uh, astronomer partners and, uh, and be informed about how the research process actually works. Numerous studies have been made that, that uh, uh, getting teachers involved in, the, in real research informs their own teaching of the material. Even if they're not teaching the material that uh, uh, at the forefront of what the scientists are trying to do, it's the background material and how it actually works that's important to uh, uh, really giving students an idea that what research is like and the possibility that they might be researchers themselves eventually.